stamping my mark on earth Laughing on the road of life Dancing with the wind Emotions in and out like the tide Moving beyond the hurt Learning I don't need to run Unafraid of revealing These crazy feelings that come Challenge brought me to tears But I overcame my fears Day by day, life reappears Before my eyes Thriving So much more than surviving My name is Sarandris Velasquez and I'm a Hall High School junior and a member of uh, JT Connect and I'm a board member. Um, I want to take a moment to thank everyone who made tonight possible, so thank you to Hall High School for allowing us to use this space, um, to the Consulate General's Office for organizing the Connect Shakar's travel to Hartford, and thank you to our co-sponsors, the Action Club and Feminist Coalition for joining JT Connect tonight. It is my pleasure to introduce Lieutenant Ara Shakar. Lieutenant Shakar joined the Israel Defense Forces, identifying as a woman nearly six years ago, and is now an officer in the IDF, identifying as a man. Lieutenant Shahar is the first openly transgender member of the IDF and uses his unique experience and story to teach others about transgender rights and justice. Before meeting with us tonight, as Lieutenant Shahar spoke with students from NYU, New York City officials, and LGBT and Jewish organizations on the East Coast. In an era when more and more people are marginalized, more and more people from marginalized groups are stepping forward and giving their voice to their important role in rights in society. Lieutenant Shahar's story is a timely reminder for us for the courage and commitment needed to make positive, progressive change in our communities at local, national, and global levels. So join me in welcoming Lieutenant Shahar to Hall. First of all, thank you all for coming. It's amazing. I'm excited. Uh, so, also forgive me for my English. If something is not uh, completely clear, please stop me and, and ask me what, what did they say. Um, my name is Lieutenant Chaka. I'm 23 years old, currently in my fifth year of service in the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces. Uh, actually, if you have told me five years ago that this is how my service is going to look like, <laughs> I would never believe you. <laughs> Uh, and the main reason for it is because back then when I enlisted, um, I actually enlisted as a female. Um, for me, um, joining the IDF was never a question. In Israel, we have mandatory draft. Each and every boy or girl in the age of 18 joining the IDF, uh, for us, is not only a duty, it's an honor. Um, and, and also for me. And so, I would... I really expected, like, doing it, uh, but I didn't believe, again, back then, that it's possible to be myself as a man inside uh, the IDF. Um, coming back, last like night, uh, I was born in a small, what we call kibbutz, it's a very, very, very small town in Israel, in the, in the north. Uh, to two wonderful parents. I was actually the first daughter and the first granddaughter of my grandparents. Uh, growing up in a very small, uh, liberal and community, in the age of two, I came to my parents and told them I want to shave my head. They looked at me and said, mm, okay. <laughs> and when I was five years old, I came to them and uh, demanded to get rid of all of the dresses and skirt in my closet. They looked at me and said, mm, okay. And I guess from this moment on, uh, they let me be myself. Um, I think until the age of five, approximately, um, 
I knew, like, uh, I told my parents or even maybe other people that I wanted to be a boy. Uh, but early, early on, uh, I guess in, in the age of five or six, I realized this is not, this is not something you can say out loud. And so I stopped saying. Um, I kept being myself, but didn't really un understood exactly what I feel or what does it mean. Um, growing up, I had really great, uh, you know, childhood. Uh, kibbutz is like uh, uh, really. Um, it's it's a nice area where everything like you don't have a lot of roads. Everything is like grass and open, and you can play outside. Really nice for you know kids and dogs. Uh, and so for me it was really nice, and I didn't really um, like address my, my my gender. I didn't even I think back then knew the meaning of the word gender. Um, I do remember. For example, one day when I was 10 years old, I just came back from the barber shop after shaving my head again. Uh, I stood up in, in the shower before, um, before getting in, looking, looking at myself in the mirror and saying to myself, this is not my body. This is a body of some young girl that could actually be uh, beautiful, but I'm ruining it. I'm ruining her body, like I'm shaving her head off, I'm uh, dressing her in boy's clothing, and I, I'm hurting her. And with this thought, I, I get into the shower, went out, and never thought about it again. Um, in the beginning of puberty, you can all imagine that, uh, uh, do you know the word dysphoria? you know what it means? I, 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 I call it like, um, it was the next step of dysphoria for me, like feeling my body is not mine and, and actually studying puberty, I found myself, I don't know if you know it, but in Israel in the summer, like uh, it's, I don't know how can you call it, in Fahrenheit because it's weak, in Celsius, it's like can you get to 40 degrees Celsius, really, really hot, uh, and yet I found myself wearing like three layers of, of, of um, shirts, uh, and the biggest one is like something I bore from my dad or something just to cover up my body and feeling more and more uncomfortable with my body as the years uh, went by. The hormone treatment is considered to be in some states life-saving treatment because when you start hormone treatment you can see that the suicide rate, uh, rate going down by more than 50% so it actually uh, made the same difference with me and my family. As my beard started growing, I like I, I started liking looking at, at the mirror. Um, I don't have this feeling anymore of this attachment from my body. Like I don't love it. I feel like okay, this is mine. I, I need to change a few things, but a lot more comfortable actually over uh, the first few years of high school, um, I you know I get to know uh, my friends really, really good and had like a close group of friends and we all were like feeling that we know each other and know everybody's secrets and like you are the most important uh, people in my life and like all we feel in, we're 16, 15 and still for me something was wrong. Something was off because you are my best friends and you still don't know the most basic thing about me. I'm not really a girl. And so, actually, I didn't even... It wasn't about sharing my gender identity as much as just sharing my, you know, basic feelings. Like, I'm 15. I want to tell you about the girl that I like. I cannot do it because... How can I tell you about this girl if you don't know that I'm actually a boy? Like, I'm not a lesbian. Something with this world, world never like, fit, fits to me. I, I don't know. I now know why, but back then I, I didn't know why you know, this world is 
it's not defining right the way I feel. And so I felt disconnected from my friend. Um, and actually, I found myself um, deciding, deciding that uh, if until the 1st in June, I cannot find a way to tell uh, someone somehow, I'm going to tell someone neutral, like go to a psychiatrist or something like this, and tell him because I have to get it off my chest. And so two weeks before the 1st of June and this year, uh, I met someone. Uh, his name is Ellie. He uh, just started dating a, a good friend of mine. And when I first met him, he identified as a trans man. I looked at, I looked at him and said, OK, what does it mean? He said, it means that I was born a female, but I'm actually a, a man. I was in shock and looked at him and said, you can actually do that? And he smiled and said, yes. For me, it was, it was the first time I ever heard uh, someone using this word in a way that I can also relate to it. He gave me the, wo the, 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 the words the, the, to explain others and even myself, how do I feel, how I always felt. And for me, it was like the missing piece of the puzzle. I guess um, in the next few months, I told my family, my closest friends, and started just living it at myself in, in these um, uh, circles, if you can call it. My mom was the first that I told, from, uh, that I told you from uh, my family. Um, she cried. Uh, and when I asked her why, she said that she don't want me to have a hard life. Uh, I get it. Uh, but beside it, she had some questions, and uh, this is it. She actually, from the moment that I told her, she always kept pushing me and tell, uh, and, and tell me, like, you have to speak to your dad, you have to speak to your dad. And I, do, I, I don't know why, but, like, uh, it took me more time to, to speak to him. Um, he's, he's a wonderful man, very, like, he learned um, uh, psychology, like, he's very, he's very sensitive and stuff. I don't know why. It took me some more time, and uh, back then he had a motorcycle that I, of course, really liked to ride on. We drove to um, near near a forest, near near the kibbutz. He sat uh, in, he sat me down and said, "Your mom said we need to talk." <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so we talked, and again he asked uh, he asked questions. Uh, back then they both. Um, ask me if now I want them to change the way they uh, address me. And back then I felt that, I said yes, but if you get confused, it's okay. If you have a hard time, it's okay. I actually, I have two little brothers, um, which uh, one is now uh, 20, and I never told him. <laughs> I don't know if he just, he, he actually, the first one who tried to, uh, who started to address me as a man, but I never told him. <laughs> so I don't know if my mom told him or he just picked it up. I don't know. Uh, the, mo the, the, the little one is little. He's 16 years old. And I told him last uh, the family because back then he was, I guess, 10 years old and I was afraid that, uh, first of all, he wouldn't understand. And second of all, uh, as I said, I didn't tell told, told everyone. I told my uh, closest friends and my family. And to be raised in a kibbutz, which means everybody knows everyone and everybody speak about everyone. Uh, it's, like, it's like living your whole life in, in, in high school. <laughs> and so, yeah. I, back then, I, I didn't feel uh, that I'm ready for everybody to know, and I guess uh, I was afraid that if uh, my 10-year-old brother would know, everybody would know. Uh, so I didn't tell him, and actually my mom pushed me uh, also to tell him. Uh, she said she don't want uh, secrets uh, inside the family. And my mom is very embarrassing, and she decided to tell everyone. And so she did the, the work, this work for me. She told my whole, like, uh, family, uh, grandma, uh, grandfathers and, and uncles and stuff. And so she did uh, my, my work a lot easier. Uh, I remember one moment when I came visit my aunt in the north. She have uh, three uh, daughters. 
and the older one, the oldest is 16, then I guess uh, 12, and then 7. And I came visit them, and they picked me up from uh, the train station, and the girls uh, sat uh, in the back seat, and I came to, to, uh, to the front seat, and my, my aunt uh, said to me, okay, so just to be clear, how would you like us to address you as, as a male or female? And then I shyly like smiled and said, male? And she, sh and she said, mm, okay, girls, did you hear? From now on, offer is a boy. <laughs> so this was the, the reaction. Uh, again, some guardian angel, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's Shachar in Hebrew. It's a uh, name also for boys and girls, so my parents just, you know, uh, make it easier for me. <laughs> I never needed to change my name. Growing up, I found out that in Hebrew, you know, if you use present, you need to uh, address a lot of gender in your language, but if you speak about, you, uh, about yourself in the past or in the future, you don't have to use uh, any gender pronouns. So I started to speak with. Later on, I, I figured out that, you know, I'm not that smart, everybody does it. <laughs> a lot of trans people do it. Currently, there is no like official change in the vocabulary of the Hebrew, but you do see a lot of people using mixed, um, like when they speak to a crowd, um, like not to individual, but addressing to, to a lot of people, they use both, uh, both genders, like changing the language by themselves in order to uh, address everyone. Uh, you also see uh, like uh, some sort of, um, I don't know, it's even a political statement if you can call it. When in Hebrew, when you address a, um, a group, you address a group as, uh, as males. Um, but you see a lot of people now uh, addressing groups as females in order to do the opposite. When I, I speak to young kids now, I try to explain them that if the parents have uh, having a hard time to adjust it doesn't mean that they don't love you. It's something that sometimes kids um, get really offended by if, if their parents don't uh, succeed to change the way they address the kid immediately. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, if they get confused, it doesn't mean they don't accept me or don't love me. And so I let them be confused for a few months. <laughs> Towards the end of high school, when we start getting letters from the military about my recruitment. Uh, for me, I was very, very excited, like all of my friends, like uh, we expect to, to go to service because first of all, it's like, like I don't know, uh, experience that we all want. And also, like I said earlier, it's a great honor. It's like taking uh, um, part of, of something important. And so for me, it wasn't even a question if I would go. And what, and what uh, like my service is going to look like. I decided, also decided that my gender identity is not going to be a problem. That I'm going to do the best service that I can, and nothing will um, stand in my way. But as the months go, uh, go by, uh, went by, I started to realize, you know, my gender is something I need to address, and it cannot be ignored. The question is, how? I was uh, afraid that my gender identity will uh, interfere with my service and even prevent me from doing it right. And so I decided that I'm not going to tell anyone uh, from my peers about it. Uh, I am going to be honest with my commanders because back then I also decided that uh, I believe the military need to know about my identity. First of all, because I need to be honest with them. And second of all, because if I may need help in any way sometime, I should be able to uh, come to my commander. And actually, so I did. Uh, in my first day uh, in boot camp, uh, we all have, like, each and every soldier in his first day have a personal conversation with his commander in order to get to know each other better. And in this conversation, she asked me, she was 19 years old, only a year older than me. She asked me, I told her exactly what I told you, 
and of course I was the first trans she ever met. Uh, you can imagine all the questions she had, but the only thing she asked me is, what can I do to help? I told her what I told everyone before her. Uh, in the IDF we have <coughs> men's uniform and women's uniform. Uh, don't uh, think for a moment that the women's uniform is in any way feminine. It's not. <coughs> but gender is more than just... Um, uh, gender is something that has to do a lot with how uh, people see us, not only uh, how you know, it's not neutral, and so to be an IDF soldier wearing this women's uniform, it doesn't matter if someone from the outside wouldn't know, like, wouldn't think it's feminine. Uh, the people from uh, inside the military would know that this is a women's clothing, and for me, it, like, wearing a sticker over my forehead says, I'm a woman. And so for me, it wasn't something I could imagine myself doing. And so before I joined the military, I started and I, I tried in many ways to get um, approval to wear men's uniform and couldn't succeed. I met a lot of you know, nice and positive people that were actually very um, uh, uh, were, were okay with what I told them, but couldn't find any way to help. And so when I told my commander, this is the only thing I need. I don't need anything else. Um, she said, okay, let me check and, and come back to you. And she actually came back the uh, next day and told me that she's very sorry, but she couldn't find any way to give me, to give me a mentor before. But she, found, she, she, thought, she thought about a very uh, creative solution. In the IDF, we also have work uniform. Not official one, but work uniform. And this work uniform are unisex, uh, similar to men and women. And so she gave me a permission to wear only the work uniform in order for me never to wear women's uniform anymore. And it was a brilliant, brilliant idea. And it's actually what helped me um, never address this, this issue again. Um, and still, you know, I didn't, told me, I didn't uh, tell my peers uh, back then. And I was actually always living in fear that someone would find out uh, or figure out that I'm trans and I don't know how but um, he would find out or she would find out and then uh, they will make a problem and so I always got the right treatment from my commanders it's actually you know I, I was until I became an officer it always surprised me how can it be you know Commanders, uh, no matter how old they are, if they are one year older than me or old enough to be my parents, if they are from academic background or uh, um, from a combat unit, if they are religious or secular, everyone treated me the same, same with the same respect and you know um, consideration. And still, you know, nobody from my friends knew <coughs> about my my identity about their real me and so I felt I felt alone. After one year in service, I get chosen to go to officer post. For me it was a great honor to be chosen to go to this course and actually became an officer like my, my uh, parents and grandparents. Early in the beginning of the course we start uh, we start to speak about you know which kind of commander are you going to be, what kind of officer? We, uh, what kind of re relationship uh, do you want to have with your uh, soldiers. And for me, it was clear that I want to have an open and honest relationship with my soldier. I want them to be able to trust me. In order to, to have this sort of relationship, I have to be honest and open with them. But you know, to realize something and to actually do something about it is two different things. And so it took me almost uh, three more months eh, until I get to the point where I can sit in front of my company of 60 cadets and tell them who I really am. I don't remember much from this talk. I remember looking at, at my commander and then the floor and then my commander and then the floor because <laughs> I was so stressed out. I'm not telling them this, this story because I want them to better know me, this is a bonus. 
I'm telling them, them this story because I want them to be able to be better commanders, better officers to the soldiers. In the IDF, because we have mandatory draft, because in the IDF you meet all sorts of people, and as a commander, you will have all sorts of soldiers. We learn about the different communities in Israel. We learn about uh, Orthodox, we learn about secular people, we learn about Jews and Muslims and Bedouin and Christians because they are all going to be our soldiers. And the LGBT community in general, it's also um, something that my peers is going to maybe comment in the future. And so I told them exactly this. I want to give you a tool to better command your soldiers. Not everybody can be an officer. And part of uh, being an officer in the IDF is to be sensitive and to be inclusive. And, you know, the screening process of uh, being chosen to be an officer, I guess it in some way put the right persons, uh, the right people over there. Being transphobic or homophobic, it's not acceptable. So even though, even if someone in the room were not okay with it, the like the system, if we can call it like this, the, the, made it very clear that this is not acceptable. Like the IDF would not tolerate uh, this kind of um, comments. Everyone was were supportive in a way I couldn't imagine. Like it's funny because um, I was sleeping in the women's dorm because you know this is what my ID says and I didn't say, say otherwise and so uh, my roommates, my female roommates came to me and, and told me why did it say Elliot? <laughs> like we know you so so well, we, we slept together for the last few months, how how can you not tell, uh, tell us? Uh, <laughs> I was embarrassed, I didn't know what to say. But actually, again, I had such an amazing luck, but you know, I don't know, saying luck, it's like uh, not give them the credit they deserve. So I feel uh, I was surrounded by amazing people. Currently, I am going back home every day, so I don't need to stay in any dorms. <laughs> uh, but when I, when I do and when I did, uh, I started uh, living in the men's dorms uh, after I came out. Uh, I started my physical tr transition um, a few weeks before that, but uh, it didn't have anything to do with it. I uh, graduated my officer course as a male officer, the one that I started as a female cadet, and actually started my service uh, in the behavioral, an behavioral analysis unit uh, of the ground forces. Um, my first year of service was Pretty normal, actually. Uh, frankly, you know, this feeling to be able to be judged only by my professional performances, to be like anybody else, was something that, you know, was priceless for me, was what they always wanted, just to be, you know, normal. <coughs> um, and the service gave me that. Not only in the military, actually, everywhere, in every country, in every society, if someone is transphobic, and he wants to discriminate you, uh, discriminate you because of your identity, for me, he wouldn't even know that I'm trans. He just would think, okay, this is a show the guy, but a uh, small guy. But uh, unfortunately for trans women, especially when they start, uh, if they start the, trans the physical uh, transitioning uh, later in life, um, they are having a harder time to what we call pass being identified as a cis woman and so for them it's, it's a lot harder from this point of view. Think about kids. If a girl is uh, considered to be a tomboy, it's even cute. But in our society, if a boy decided he wants to uh, wear dress, it's a lot less acceptable. Uh, acceptable. And so I think you can see it um, uh, the same uh, reaction when we are growing up. In the IDF, we have an office devoted to gender affairs. Uh, it's, it's wonderful, it's amazing. A uh, very high rank officer, Brigadier General, officer, uh, Brigadier General is commanding this unit. Um, and together we started uh, thinking about you know, uh, trans service. And again, the IDF, everybody 
is welcome to come and join the IDF. Everybody is going to serve in the IDF, and so the IDF is obligated to provide them with a um, safe environment and a respectful uh, um, place to be in. And so we started thinking together, what does it mean? How can, what and how can we um, provide those soldiers uh, the environment they deserve? And so actually the first thing we did was to analyze my personal experience and understanding my personal, from my personal story, what uh, did I needed back then. For example, the uniform. For example, the good treatment that I got from my commanders. Should it be an issue of personal judgment? We should instruct every uh, commander to give uh, the right kind of um, treatment to their soldiers. Two things I need to explain. First, I don't work for the Office of Gender Affairs. I do something else completely. I do infrastructure. <laughs> the the uh, Gender Affairs Office is what I do in lunchtime. Uh, like a hobby. Uh, and the other thing I need to explain, in the IDF, because uh, we have a lot of religion people uh, from all kinds of religion, but uh, especially uh, Judaism. Uh, we have an also we have an office uh, that um, regarding um, all sorts of uh, aspects of religion in everyday life of the soldiers, in order to you know not offend anyone in any way. Uh, and actually, we don't let let them interfere. Interfere. Sorry. We, this is just, you know, we don't ask them. Nobody asks them about what their opinion about uh, LGBT people. Uh, I think, you know, let them deal with kosher food and let <laughs> the gender affair office de deal with, ge with gender. <coughs> when uh, orthodox trans people came to us, and it happened a few times, we tried to help them in any way they needed. If it's uh, support or if it's like to find them a place to be, uh, something with their family would go wrong. We we did it inside like uh, the general affairs office and uh, office that's responsible for supporting soldiers. We we don't face yet any problem with the religion office, and I think that if it will came along, it will be very clear that this is just not their um, uh, expertise. expertise exactly. This is not their issue and. I'm not, you know, I'm not um, the one to say it, but I do think personally, completely personally, that the IDF knows and realizes that, you know, LGBT people are part of the Israeli society and equal like everybody else, and I strongly believe personally that I don't see a uh, situation where the Office of uh, Religion try to um, in any way push uh, LGBT people from, from the IDF. They wouldn't let it. It's like, this is a red line. I know uh, from other militaries um, that there is like a question about uh, do trans uh, person that is like dependent on um, hormones can be in the battlefield or something? And the answer for it is really, really simple. Of course, yes. Like, if I don't get my shots, my shot of testosterone today, I can get it tomorrow, and even after a week. It's not, you know, the best, but it's not, it's not hurtful in any way. So it, it, it's not, it's not a problem. The IDF is not perfect. Nobody is perfect, but we do have very strict policy about uh, uh, homophobic um, or uh, uh, sexist or. Um, or transphobic act. And so for trans people inside the military, personally at least, I feel like it's safe. It's funny, but think about it. If you walk on the street with a trans person uh, and someone decides to say something offensive to you, you, can, you couldn't do a lot about it. But inside the IDF, if someone uh, saying something um, offensive to you, you can easily um, uh, charge them um, uh, the press charges against him, he can be court martialed and even go to jail. <laughs> Just because he said something transphobic or homophobic, and it's amazing. Uh, so actually, I think for a lot of people, a lot of trans people, they 
military <coughs> can be even a safer place to, to begin, to begin, I hope. And in my first year, I truly didn't like address my gender identity at all. Until one day, a friend of mine from office circles, after one year, I think, from graduation, uh, she called me. She served back then in the uh, focus unit, and she told me that a uh, reporter uh, contacted them uh, because he heard my story and he wanted to do an article about me. And I said, okay, I don't care, do whatever you like. What can, what can happen? Uh, a few days later, I, I read the article between us. It wasn't good. <laughs> uh, a lot of misgendering and, you know, not completely like following the facts. Articles, how, can, how true can it be? Um, I was very offended by it uh, and decided, you know, that I'm never going to do any interviews again. <laughs> like, um, but two weeks later, she called me again, my friend from the focus again, and told me that uh, some kid contacted the reporter to contact them so they can contact me <laughs> because he's also trans and he's also going to recruit in a few months and he wants to ask me how can he also do it successfully. Of course I called him. Um, but after him came another one and another one and another one and I realized, you know, there is something bigger than me going on. I'm getting my captain rank in the summer, and then two months later, released from the army. In Israel, we first go to the military and then to college, which means I never got a chance to go to college yet, yet so I really want to study. I didn't decide if I want to do like a big trip before that. It's also something we do in Israel, like yeah. get released from the military and then go, I don't know, explore um, South America or uh, India or something. Uh, it's a thing in Israel. Um, and so I didn't decide exactly what I want to do, um, but I do think like uh, people ask me, okay, so what, what about all your work in the military? I can't imagine myself stop doing it. Um, I just don't know exactly how I would keep doing it. In, in Israel, we also have a, a reserve force very active reserve force, and so um, I think I will be stationed at the general field. Like this will be my reserve uh, duty, and so keep doing what I'm doing over there. Um, I'm a nerd, so I want to <laughs> learn uh, engineering. Uh, but this is like the plan, no, no specifics yet. <laughs> I'm really proud to say that today trans people in Israel can join the IDF and could have a better service than I had. My service was amazing, but they wouldn't need to deal with the issues that I had to, do, to deal with. They would get the right kind of uniform and the right kind of treatment and a separate time to go to the shower and will not be um, considered different in any way. They could just be themselves. And I hope this experience for them could, could contribute to their confidence the way it contributes to mine. Thriving, so much more than surviving. It's really living, it's forgiving. Letting go.